Hey everybody, welcome. So we're gonna talk about a really hot topic. I'm Ray Wong, as, as people mentioned earlier. Uh, this is really hot. We're talking about generative AI, large language models, and more importantly, what it means in the enterprise. And so I'm gonna start here with George first, in the middle. Um, George, you've been investing a lot in the space. Like, why? What, what's hot and what do you see as some of the bigger trends that are popping up? Yeah, right. So when we start thinking about where this entire sort of movement towards generative AI is going, we got to sort of understand, and particularly in the last session, it was interesting to kind of hear, you know, the substrate and the, and the foundation of this is all data. And that's absolutely right. Because ultimately, like, this is now a movement that's built on what we now see today as the modern data stack. The ability to now build models at scale using an MLOps layer and now kind of building generative AI applications. So at Insight, we've been focused on really looking at those three layers effectively in terms of where this next generation of enterprise-based software applications go. Um, from an investment standpoint, led a number of key initiatives there. So led the astronomer round and sort of the next generation of Airflow. We were long on Snowflake and Databricks. And then additionally went into the MLOps layer and was the lead investor into a company called Weights and Biases, which is a partner of C3 AIs. And then most recently led the round in Jasper, which is a content marketing solution that's been built for and purposely for content marketers with a generative AI underpinning, which is the second fastest growing software company ever. So give you a sense of like how fast things are happening in the market. We are just talking about this in the green room. Like you're one of the few VCs that actually get the technical requirements for something that works. So what, what generative AI models and generative AI companies would you say um, don't pass the test for you? Like what's, what's important in terms of seeing something that actually applies to the enterprise versus something that might be more consumer oriented? Yeah, so first and foremost, I, I, I think I, I try to ensure that like the companies that I invest into um, actually are doing it with a purpose that and an understanding of like how these stacks are effectively built, right? It, you have to have um, a modern data substrate for this to make sense. You have to have a clear understanding of how to build machine learning models at scale. But I think there's a moment here that we should just be all aware of, right? And that's the fact that we've entered a, a world where transformer-based models are now taking over in terms of how this next generation of deep learning, and particularly unsupervised deep learning, is effectively playing out. And so the things that we can do today as we add more and more data into these transformer-based models is quite profound. And some of it we're now we're seeing in large language models, some of it we're seeing in image stability generations, we're seeing this in how acoustic waveforms can be understood, and now the next generation of these models are becoming multimodal, like they're coming in to where it understands images, text, yep. uh, acoustic waveforms in a singular model. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting moment in, in generative AI, both both from a builder and an investor standpoint, I tend to try to find things that are you know, uniquely focused on a use case, right? So good examples of this. Um, looking at a company right now that can take code that's already been built and generatively create all the unit testing necessary to scaffold you know, what would historically not have had good unit testing capabilities, but it was now generatively created using a model. So there's incredible opportunities um, that are emerging in software as we speak. And I kind of look at this today and I see the entire you know, realm of software being reimagined with a generative underpinning. Um, so in my view, like this is um, as big as, you know, certainly the TAM of, of all of software and could be as big as the TAM of all of humanity. This is a seminal moment, is what you're saying right now. So, uh, Pradeep, what do you see uh, from Sava Nova Vision um, and Promise of Generative AI? What does that mean, right, in terms of transformation in the enterprise? Because you're also coming at it from a different approach. Yep. Uh, I completely agree with George. This is like a watershed moment for everybody in software. Uh, the way we write code, the way we test code, the way we put applications out. Uh, you know, I've been in this space from productivity standpoint to automation to where we are right now, but this opportunity is bigger than anything else. But to add to what George was saying, there's only about two, 300 people in the world who know how to train these large language models um, to actually put them in production, whatever that means, right? Because a lot of stuff, for example, what Terry was talking about in the earlier uh, lecture about MLOps, MLOps for large language models looks drastically different, right? When you start actually putting them in an enterprise, right? ChatGPT, uh, there's no way you can take an instance of ChatGPT right now and put it behind your firewall, right? 
So at Samanoa, that was a vision where we started. Can you build a stack which can take the state of the art uh, models, whether that's VIT, whether that's you know GPT-3, um, and give that thing in a box to the customers where they own the data, they own the stack, they own the model, and they can put them wherever they want uh, instead of you know going to a public cloud, uh, uploading their data up there. Um, so it's 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 a, transform, a transformational moment for every one of us. So customers can take back the control um, and, and actually actually be much more secure than they were before. Is what you're saying? Yep. So okay, Nikhil, you guys have just talked about the generative AI suite, the product suite. Uh, tell us more about that. Yeah. For, well, for us at, at C3 AI. We're really interested in the enterprise. So we're focused, razor focused on what generative AI means for our enterprise customers and our enterprise uh, prospects. Um, and uh, I, I, I agree with, the, uh, with, with George and PD. This definitely feels like an inflection point in, in our industry, in software. Um, and the way we think about it in terms of the generative AI product suite is we want to take innovations from our partners like uh, uh, Samba Nova or Google um, uh, or Microsoft, and we want to bring that uh, into the enterprise. But by itself, those large language models are um, you know, not very useful for our enterprise customers. We need to do a lot of innovation and package a lot of you know, our decade plus experience in, in enterprise software around these models um, to make them truly transformative. So you know, I'm interested in, um, there's really two things. You know, one that Tom mentioned yesterday, where the generative AI uh, products, these products can fundamentally change the human computer interaction model for our enterprise customers. And we're really focused on that when it comes to information retrieval as our first um, use case for this uh, effort. But then there's a second piece as well, which, which is um, very interesting to us, which is that we're going to attach, or we're attaching this capability to all of our pre-built applications. Right? So now imagine you have a predictive maintenance application, or you have a um, um, supply chain application, and you actually don't have to learn how to use the application in order to uh, extract value from it. So, so the, the, that's where we're starting, Ray. So it's like a marketplace of models is what you're setting up? Yeah, so these, uh, these models, um, in a future state, I think they can be these large language models coupled with some of the other technologies we're, we're, we're developing are going to orchestrate data, they're going to orchestrate applications, they're going to orchestrate you know, purpose-built ML models for the enterprise and just make it you know, much easier for the enterprise to unlock value. This is actually really powerful. We're basically moving in a model from we're going from data to decisions at light speed, right? And as we do that, I mean, think about it. Like a human decision, we can make it in a split second, right? But how long does it take you guys to get it out of management committee? A week? A month? <laughs> a quarter? Anybody a year? Right? Never? Right? And machines are making decisions hundreds of, sec hundreds of times per second, even thousands of times per second. I mean, this notion of decision velocity is something that's going to change uh, in terms of how organizations compete. Uh, it's an asymptotic advantage is what we're going to see across the board. Uh, and right, one thing I want to clarify on that, uh, it, it, is, it, it is an asymptotic advantage for, that we're seeing in the market for you know, how decision making is going to be made. But I think it's important, and I think it was also sort of highlighted in the last session as well. This is... And Nikhil actually uh, framed it quite nicely, particularly in terms of how C3 is thinking about it as well. This is about the human-machine symbiosis, right? Yes. This is about a moment where humans and machines can make better decisions at scale with the fact that these models are going to help them. Like, this is not a question of, like, you know, we're just going to let models run wild um, and see what happens, right? <laughs> this is actually going to be a moment where models are going to continue to be refined. The, reinforcement learning from humans is going to come back to improving how a model helps drive a decision. And so that sort of rate of decision making and the quality of decision making by humans is going to be um, sort of transformationally improved than what we've ever seen before. And that's what really excites me today. Yeah, no, and, and, and I think you know, when you think about this uh, PD, I mean, one of the things that's happening is we're going from you know, full intelligent automation, you know, you've been in that place where people have done that, uh, augmenting the machine with a human, augmenting the human with the machine, and when do we actually insert the human into the process? Those are four questions everyone's going to be asking across the journey. Um, when you look at that, PD, like what, what are some important things for people to factor? When do you insert the human into the process? You know, that, that is a, an age-old question. So the automation, in the automation, you know, uh, at UiPath, we were one of the first ones to put the human in the loop. Um, in the whole situation. So you could take a machine learning model, put the human in the loop. So for example, if your invoices that you're uh, processing through the system, if they are failing, 
um, as soon as the confidence level drops below a certain threshold, it would say, okay, can you, the model would say, can you help me annotate some stuff? But what George talked about is a transformational change. These models, like about three years ago, people used to ask me, you know, what is the difference between ML and AI? And my answer to that was, and it was a simplistic answer, was AI is truly something which is self-learning. And the self-learning cannot happen without the feedback from the people. There are a couple of things that generative AI enables. Like all of us at some point you know, are curious about things. Like that is a fundamental human quality uh, that we need to supplement, that we need to accentuate. Because in every one of our lives and use cases, as we are working, there's that moment of creativity. You know, whether you're a doctor, whether you're an accountant, how do you bring in the machines at that right time? And so uh, what Josh talked about is, is in ChatGPT, there's a component at the back for reinforcement learning. It's called RLHF. Anybody who can figure out how to put the RLHF in known business processes to accelerate them is gonna cause that fundamental change in the whole business process acceleration. I mean, think about it. hire, retire, procure to pay, campaign yep. to lead, right? All these are gonna be impacting significantly. Yep. Uh, Nick, you'll talk about that, right? I mean, that's the enterprise, that is our business here. No, I, I, I agree, and I think um, uh, the trick is gonna to be to find the, uh, the, well, there's a couple of things. One is find the pieces of the software infrastructure that enable that. I mean, we're, we're, we're really aggressively thinking about that as part of our product roadmap is how do we stitch together the components, whether it's you know, generative models, working with the retrieval models, uh, with the retraining, reinforcement learning enterprise uh, uh, for specific use cases like supply chain or reliability. I think those are the kind of innovations that will, will drive this, uh, this forward. Um, and uh, I also think that there's going to be a, a roadmap of innovation that comes also from our customers. For example, we need our customers to tell us, hey, I need to write an, uh, a you know, memo as part of a CRM process flow, or I need to write um, you know, an email as part of a supply chain uh, uh, use case. And I think finding those value pools are what, what are going to drive uh, innovation. Yeah. Petey, talk a little bit about the partnership that you guys are doing with uh, C3 and Salmonova. It's, it's, it's a pretty amazing partnership because you know, C3 has its uh, strengths in the whole enterprise stack. And so when you think of, you know, we cannot go in because we are known for providing large language models with the highest accuracy um, and a fully optimized, highly optimized stack right from silicon yep. to UX. And so you can imagine, you still have to plug, in, plug it in into different systems, both on the input side with the data sources, output side with the line of business applications. And so that's why C3 is a great partner for us because you know, we can enable all their customers to be able to use these really powerful generative AI models uh, at the back end. Before we get to George, just keep in mind, we're going to be, leave you opportunities to ask questions of this panel. As you can see, there's a lot of expertise here. So start thinking through your questions and we'll jump in. George, real quickly, safety, digital safety, digital privacy. Now we're talking about AI safety, AI privacy. Uh, what safety precautions should we worry about with generative AI? Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, a fair amount, right? <laughs> because if you think about where these generative models are built from, you know, the underlying uh, training that's going in and the underlying sort of scale of the parameters that are, that are, that are being sort of scraped off the public web, it's, it's a free-for-all, right? There's a fair amount of data. Are there that, ethics or policies we have to worry about? Well, I, right now, there's, no, there's almost no guardrails, right? And I think as you, th and Nikhil kind of highlighted this, as you think about how that goes into the enterprise, there is mostly a tuning and pruning exercise that needs to happen around these large language models to be just kind of safe and ready for enterprise consumption. Part of this is just being able to kind of monitor what's in production, right? So I made an investment to a company called Fiddler and their entire business model is to basically provide observability on models as they're going into production. Part of this is exactly about the reinforcement learning that comes about that, you know, as these models improve over time, you need to be able to sort of bring that back into the model itself. 
Uh, but yeah, look, we, there's been some public things that happened in the last four weeks, right? If you like, you know, went into chat GPT, uh, or I'd say even, even Bing chat uh, almost uh, four weeks ago, and you started to ask it about its shadow self, right? There's a creepy version of, uh, uh, of Sydney that, that, that underlied you know, that, that deep learning model. Now, I, I think that a lot of that's a little bit early and it's a bit sensational because you can find these like dark corners inside these models that exist today. That'll change over time and it's actually gonna change very, very quickly, right? Because as we start to understand what these models can do creatively, you wanna enable that creativity to continue to progress, but you do still need to understand what these limitations and guardrails are. So um, a big part of this is gonna come down to content moderation. Right? A big part of this is gonna come down to the do's and don'ts of the rules of the road that you're gonna have to give it. Ultimately, when you start to feed in these inputs properly, I believe these models will be much, much more contained and much more managed for enterprise readiness. It's actually one of the biggest areas where I think actually C3 uh, and others in the enterprise space will have tremendous benefit to be able to kind of build finely tuned enterprise ready large language models that are sort of meant for enterprise consumption and scale, while the consumer world continues to go figure out what these edges are that we can, uh, <laughs> see, we can cross them what we can't. So stay in the enterprise is what you're saying. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, but, but, but George, like, well, well, will government come in and say, here's the rules, right? You're gonna establish policies, or do you think industry is gonna come up with it? Uh, yeah. Who's gonna get there first? Yeah, so, so I, I am a big believer in regulation in, in, in this topic. Now, now, here's my problem on the regulatory front uh, uh, when it comes to where we are, um, both on the consumer and the enterprise side. One, the regulatory bodies that are involved, particularly outside of the EU, are actually not robustly thinking about these things. Probably, They're very narrow on that. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and so the technology is actually moving way faster in a lot of ways than the regulatory bodies can actually keep up. Now, if the regulatory bodies can keep up, as in they're fast, thoughtful, and iterative, just like these models are, then I'd be very excited to see some of this regulation come about alongside of the models that are being developed at scale. My sense is that it's gonna be about a half a decade where the, the model production and the scale of what's happening, particularly in this sort of GPT-4 and GPT-5 style model, because um, what's gonna emerge is effectively somewhere between, in this next generation, one to five trillion parameters in a large language model, and then potentially as much as 25 to 50 trillion parameters. Yep. Once you get to that sort of 25-ish trillion parameter uh, sort of scale of how many parameters are going into these large language models, we're actually running out of human corpus. Like, mm -hmm. there's only, <laughs> the, the, there's no more human knowledge and, and left. Power. And at least, power, at least that's publicly available, right? And so, so I think over time, this will settle down, right? And then what we'll, we'll start to see is the importance of all of this private data, all of these enterprise interactions really play well into how models will, you know, sort of really transform humanity. And in that regard, um, I do see that's the moment that regulatory sort of frameworks will also need to be applied at scale. No, no, great point. And, and we're also looking at level one AI ethics, right? You know, transparency in the models, right? Explainability, ability to actually kind of like, you know, reverse things if we have issues, right? The ability to actually, you know, train these over time and then of course get to some human-led process in between as a, as a control. Yeah, and, and we, we need the explainability um, day one, right? Because like even in the last few weeks, what, what's fascinating to see is the models right now are kind of built to please us, right? And so <laughs> if it doesn't necessarily have a proper answer, it will synthetically create it, right? And so if you ask it to cite research on you know, where this response kind of came from, if the proper data isn't there, it will synthetically generate a, you know, a citation of a researcher that may have write, wrote that paper, but actually never did, right? Because it's actually kind of creating something that's close enough because again, uh, there wasn't enough data sort of fed to it. Yeah, so those kind of challenges are, are, are going to be solved as, yeah, more data. But George, comes. I was living in the moment. It was great. I did a chat GBT on my own bio, and it said I got a degree from Harvard. My mom was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wrote a book for Harvard, but oh well. That's okay. Right. I'll take it was information. Crazy, right? That's I'll exactly what information. No, but Ray, on that point, right, so this is the exact reason why I think the first generation of these models at least for the enterprise, we shouldn't use the large language models by themselves. They're, they're more a language interface. Exactly. And it's really a human interface to the, to the enterprise 
uh, data set. And that also, by the way, avoids all the regulatory issues that we can s literally sidestep for the next several years, at least in the enterprise domain, until we're able to understand these we'll things We'll be cleaning up false positive, yeah. false negatives for quite some time. But this takes into the role of the ecosystem, Nikhil, right? I mean, you, we all play a different play, piece in this ecosystem. You've got the large cloud providers, Google, Microsoft, other folks, and then, of course, the things that you're developing. How do you guys fit into the ecosystem? Where do you see that ecosystem evolving? Well, uh, a couple of points, right? Number one, I think um, there's just such a tremendous interest in this space. There's going to be a prolifer proliferation of these large language models that we see over the next several years. I mean, OpenAI is going to be in the game. Microsoft's in the game with them. Google, our partner, our is, is very big in the space. Companies like Samba Nova that provide very um, you know, unique stacks all the way from the silicon to, um, uh, to the uh, LLM layer. So I do think there's going to be a lot of innovation in the space. We want to make... Uh, you know, uh, the way we're seeing uh, our company is we want to take those innovations, but then also do all of the rest of the e enterprise plumbing to make them available to our customers. Um, and so we're, um, and then we, there's the situations where we need to deploy models behind firewalls. Yep. We need to deploy models, you know, in internet disconnected environments. Uh, I mean, so we need to uh, have, be able to use the large language models, but then also smaller instruction tuned models where that's appropriate. Um, so we're really thinking about all of that and trying to build a very open platform that's, um, uh, that is you know, pre-bound to our partners like Google, Samba Nova, et cetera, uh, but at the same time flexible and we can evolve as, uh, as situations change. Sure, it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to do something, and as you guys probably know, we've changed up all the questions here on stage intentionally to have some fun. Let's talk hype cycles. I'm going to go down the line. We're all <coughs> in the hype cycle of generative AI. PD. I think we are just starting off, right? It's, it's, it's going to take a lot of effort to flesh out all the use cases, flesh out all the guardrails, like, you know, what George was talking about. This is, it's a classic, it's a problem in language models called hallucination, right? When does hallucination happen? How do you actually handle it? So our research teams right now, uh, so I was talking to Nikhil last week, uh, we've come up with a solution where you know, we tie in explainability using semantic search. So in ChatGPT right now, you can go in and you know, it, it, it's, it's because the objective function is pleasing the human, and it turns out the best way to please a human is probably lie to them. To lie, right? yeah. <laughs> exactly. you, you just keep lying, I mean, and, and, and it's like an iterative loop of lies. Exactly, I so mean, how, do you, how, do you, <laughs> how do you tune those, the, the objective functions for the business outcomes that you need in an enterprise? How do you bring in explainability using things like semantic search where it's not just giving an insight is not the only important thing, but also explaining why, where is that content coming from because Extractive search, you know, we've, we've seen it. It's, it's been there for a long time, but... We need veracity, we need curation, and we need some kind of arbitration that's going on. Yep. George, go ahead. Where are we in the hype cycle? Yeah, just one comment on the lie. It's actually three truths and then a lie, right? Yes. Yeah, it's three truths and a lie. <laughs> that's, up why, here that's why you can never tell, right, which one is, is exactly the lie in the middle of it. Is now, that the training model? Three truths and a lie? <laughs> that, that's uh, all, all the future training models are going in exactly around that direction. So the, the hype is is profound, right? There, there's a kind of this nonstop energy, particularly in the last sort of two months around where generative is going. I think it's gonna settle down shortly and we're starting to see some of the real use cases emerge. I mean, like the, uh, the, the announcement that C3 has done on, on generative AI applications is brilliant, right? It, it just kind of profoundly shows where, you know, the application potential of where enterprises could go in using this. Now, when we look back at this in the next five to 10 years, what we'll realize is this is the most important thing that has happened probably since the internet and mobile and maybe the cloud, right? And so this is as big as those movements. And why is that? Because moving forward inside of software, you likely will never need a rules engine. Yep. You'll never need fuzzy logic. You'll never need nope. a declarative language. I think, I think we'll, when, we, when we imagine what this future of software will look like, guess what the most popular programming languages in the world are gonna be in the next decade? Well, it's gonna be English and Chinese, yes. right? And if we think about that future that's coming, right, it's, it, it's, it's, it's gonna be very hyped along the way, but there's profound world-changing things that are, 
ahead of us in this next decade, and that's what I'm really excited about. Very probabilistic. Nikhil, what's your view? Hype or where we are on the hype cycle? Well, we're pretty high on the hype cycle at this point, um, but I think the hype cycle is mainly fueled by ChatGPT. Um, that being said, the technology itself is formidable and it's super impressive. And I think it, I agree with, with what George says. Right? This is the next big thing from cloud that we've seen. And it's going to change everything about software. I'll give you an example, right? When, uh, and uh, by the way, the way we, we view these um, generated models is as reasoning engines, right? They're really the next generation of reasoning engines. Um, and in our uh, programming efforts, some of the things we can tell the model are, hey, let me know if you have enough information to answer this question. If you don't have enough information, just, you know, just, just say, I don't know. And it's going to reply back. And it, it can adapt on the fly with this kind of meta re level reasoning um, in a way that is mind blowing. And so we are able to now encode what might be days or weeks of software engineering effort and make progress in minutes to hours, right? And that, that's what I think is, is going to change the future of software. No, this is a big shift. And, and actually, what, what cracks me up is it's so much easier to do computer vision than large language models. I mean, it makes sense, but it's just amazing and fascinating how quickly stable diffusion versus chat GPT versus generative models, like it's all converging at the same time as well. So uh, are we going to run out? Uh, you said we're going to run out of human corpus, and that was kind of interesting. Are we going to run out of compute power? What do you guys think? I think we are already running out of it. Uh, like if you look at the cost of training these models, right? Uh, GPT-3, it costs around $4 million. Uh, the chat GPT-based model, uh, you know, the underlying model is, is a model called Da Vinci, took about $50 million. We are seeing the curve to be better than uh, Moore's law. Like it is decreasing the cost of training these models. But still, we don't have enough compute in the world, right? I can tell you, you know, uh, it took OpenAI a majority of the spare capacity in Azure to be able to train these models. Yeah, I don't think Azure has enough capacity if you put it on Bing. Yeah, and, and so, no, I, was, I, was, I totally agree with George. Like, the biggest models that we have in the human history, if you look at the biggest corpus of uh, books, Project Gutenberg, it's eight gigabytes. That's it? Yep. So all the books that have been written in Keep the history. writing, people. Come on. <laughs> There's no more human we, corpus. We, we just don't have enough signals <laughs> for these models. And so that's why we have to go out to, you know, Twitter and Reddit and, and, and but there's a lot of, you know, crap information out there. Uh, <laughs> and and that's that's what these the models. The of the year. Yeah, that's, that's what these models are learning. So that's why on the research side we have to go in and and put in all these guardrails and, and, and come up with all these things so that these models don't diverge. All right, do I have a compute power? But before that, instead of reading the Mary Meeker guide, we're going to be reading the George Matthew guide to <laughs> AI and generative AI. So go ahead. So, so, so uh, we, are, we are definitely supply side constrained right now. And a lot of the supply side constraint is the fact that there was a class of compute, the, the GPU itself, which really was never meant for this, by the way. <laughs> like, the GPU just happened to be really good in comparison to the CPU for what this clear class but of But there's problem more is. coming after the GPU. So what's happening next is there's a next generation of AI inference-based chips, yes. right? And we think about this next generation of AI inference-based chips to the point the PD was making, the cost of inference has to come down remarkably for this stuff to work at we scale. One right? hundredth of where we are. Because you can, you can do the math on where, where ChatGPT is right now. I think they're spending somewhere between three to five million dollars per day on the mm -hmm. inference. Per day. Right? That is not sustainable at all. So part of this, I almost equivocate to the space program, right? When we went into the 60s and looked at you know, what it took to get to the moon, the research that was required, right, the development that was required was, was in the, you know, billions. And by the way, this is exactly what's happening around the large language models right now. There's probably around 20 billion of investment going into the large language models themselves. That will likely be for the public good. I don't think any of the companies that are building large language models are gonna be able to return that back, per se, to the people who invested there, but guess what? Just like the space program, the Northrop Grumman's, the McDonnell Douglas's, the entire military industrial complex kind of formed subsequent to the initial research being done. And that's where I think the opportunity resides in this next decade because enterprise software will be completely reformatted by 
generative AI. And, yeah. and you get your next tangs and Velcros that are along the way. And, uh, and tangs and Velcros along the way. <laughs> All right, last word, quick, Nikhil. Well, see. okay, so I agree with, with my fellow panelists you get 30 on, seconds. on the computer, yeah. compute infrastructure. Um, and I was just looking up some numbers also on the energy infrastructure, so that, that's kind of my last word before, oh. before coming to the panel. So apparently ChatGPT was about 1,500 megawatt hours to train ChatGPT, which is about 550 tons of carbon emissions. Now multiply that by three orders of magnitude in terms of what's going on today in the world, uh, in GPT-4, GPT-4.5, et cetera. I do think we're gonna see orders of magnitude reduction, um, one to two orders of magnitude easily in just the optimization, but we gotta think about overall how we're gonna manage all of these models, infrastructure, carbon emissions. Uh, it's, it's all fair game at this point. Hey, thank you very much. Please give it up for Nikhil George PD. Thank you. Thank you.